Thank you all for coming. I'm Mike Hirschberg. I'm the Executive Director of the Vertical Flight Society, and I'll be talking to you today about the future of vertical flight. Uh, and this will be a bit on, uh, a little bit beyond helicopters. There's a lot of buzz on electric VTOL and other types of advanced rotorcraft and vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft. Uh, so I wanted to, I'm going to present quite a lot of uh, slides here today, and then hopefully have some time for discussion at the end where you guys can ask questions about uh, any, anything uh, specific that you're interested in. So the Vertical Flight Society, uh, we just celebrated 76 years. Uh, so we were founded when the helicopter industry was founded uh, in the U.S. And at the time, helicopters were kind of these silly uh, aircraft. They couldn't go very far, couldn't go very fast compared to uh, airplanes of the day, especially during World War II when range and payload and things like that were most important. So they, you know, they weren't really, helicopters weren't really ex, uh, accepted by the mainstream uh, aerospace and aviation industry, so the helicopter founders decided they needed a, an association, a society, uh, to help them uh, along and, and progress, progress the, the capabilities and the operations of this newfangled type of aircraft. Uh, so they started what was called the American Helicopter Society, but even from the beginning, uh, the Allies were involved during World War II, so it was international, we had international uh, officers. Uh, and from very, very early on, it, uh, the society was expanded to include all types of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, we held our first annual forum uh, 75 years ago in, in Philadelphia. We're going to be having our 75th anniversary, uh, 75th annual forum in Philadelphia this, this May, so we're very excited about that. Uh, and uh, now we have about 6,000 individu individual and over 100 corporate members uh, as part of the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, we changed our name uh, last year, last April. Um, so we had been going by AHS International, the Vertical Flight Society, for 20 years. And as you can see from the 1969 uh, logo, we started using the, the Society for Vertical Flight uh, 50 years ago. So it's always been part of our our name and our branding, but uh, we really wanted to kind of highlight that uh, in this, this brave new world of vertical flight. So just a couple of quotes here to start off with. My presentation is really going to be about disruption. Things that are going on right now are very disruptive to the helicopter industry, and you see all kinds of changes and, and new things come out. Uh, so updated uh, George Bernard Shaw with a politically correct, uh, you know, the reasonable human adapts him or herself to the world. You know, all progress depends on the unreasonable human. So somebody that doesn't accept the status quo and is going to change things uh, and hopefully for the better. Uh, also, Lynn Tilton uh, said now four years ago, uh, sorry, three years ago, uh, that, you know, we can't get comfortable with the high barriers to entry in the helicopter industry. Helicopter development moves very slowly. We need to, uh, to create uh, things faster. Uh, she said at the time, which wasn't actually correct, uh, we have not yet had a Tesla come and show us how we need to be. So at that time in 2016, there was already a lot of electric VTOL work uh, underway. Looking at the broader uh, industry or broader society, uh, drones. So in the U.S., we didn't have drone regulations until uh, just a couple years ago. So all that went offshore. So now uh, DGI has 85% of the market uh, in, in the U.S. Over a million drones now are flying. Um, other other companies, other Chinese companies also are now building uh, more drones in the U.S., so almost 100 uh, percent. The Tesla Model S uh, started, in, uh, started deliveries in uh, 2012, and now all car companies have electric cars. Um, SpaceX, Blue, uh, Blue Origin have uh, commercial space launches. Uh, the geared turbofan and the GE Leap uh, have huge improvements in fuel consumption that are now changing the way airliners uh, are being designed and operated with, with huge benefits. And then just the, the general app economy with the, the benefits from smartphones, uh, mobile apps, ride sharing like Uber and Lyft, Airbnb, things like that that are really disruptive and changing the way that we move and, and work in this society today. Uh, looking at the, the, the VTOL industry, uh, so there have been a number of improvements and advances in helicopter te technology. You see like H, uh, the H-160 with the, the blue edge blades, uh, different types of, of uh, technology that are coming now into, um, uh, into the market. 
uh, as well as uh, people developing and testing electric tail rotors, uh, fly-by-wire controls, and all kinds of other products or advances in products that have really modernized helicopters as we know them today. But there's also step changes that are coming in, uh, in uh, capabilities like range and speed from uh, advanced rotorcraft like tilt rotors and compounds. And then, uh, as we'll be discussing a little bit more in depth, uh, electric VTOL. So there's really this huge potential for just a step change, a revolutionary capability uh, in vertical flight. And this is really, the, the real thing is the technology that are going to enable higher rates of utilization. So if you can reduce costs uh, and reduce uh, the noise, then you can operate from city centers and people can be, uh, you know, they can have lots of operations and it won't be hopefully disturbing to the, uh, to the people that live there. So you can really uh, take advantage of, of regular flights and high utilization rates. Um, so a lot more people will be exposed to vertical flight uh, and really the, the, the hope is you can have VTOL for all uh, where instead of taking an Uber or a Lyft over here uh, and, and dealing with all the traffic or whatever from the airport, uh, you could get here to the con the, uh, this convention center in just a few minutes. So we have a magazine, VertiFlight, Verti uh, and we, we uh, chronicle what's going on in development. So looking at the future of uh, vertical flight technology uh, for both military and, and civil applications, uh, advanced rotorcraft, uh, advanced rotor technologies, uh, electric VTOL, uh, and you can see really quite a different, uh, quite, quite a broad span of, de of configurations that are being developed and tested, um, as well as new, you know, new players entering the market, uh, companies like Kitty Hawk, uh, you know, I mentioned before Uber, um, lots of different companies that are being, uh, um, that, are, that are getting into vertical flight, as well as new products and new capabilities from the existing helicopter industry. And, and uh, as well as new technologies for existing, uh, existing capabilities uh, for civil and military applications. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what's going on in military uh, vertical flight. Uh, so uh, most of the aircraft deployed today are old, you know, 40 to 50 years old since their first flights. Uh, they've got the latest state-of-the-art uh, you know, capabilities for those old platforms. Uh, but, um, you know, with new avionics and engines and, and rotor blades in some cases, but they're still basic designs from the, 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 the 60s and 70s. Um, the 53K from Sikorsky is the only real new design that's in the acquisition process, uh, and that'll be operational here in a few years. Um, so during the conflicts in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of t uh, capability gaps were, uh, were exposed. Um, things like payload speeds, ra speed range, endurance, altitude in the mountains, uh, as well as uh, autonomy and collaboration, uh, and survivability. So really in the future threats that the United States sees that may have to go up against, uh, it needs much longer ranges to be able to um, attack the enemy air, air defenses and survive in these, these long ranges. If you have to hop every couple hundred miles, to refuel and, and rearm, it's really going to really puts not only the the aircraft at risk, but all the support, the all the lifts that have to go out there to bring fuel and supplies and weapons, and all the people that have to have to support that. So, the real benefit that's seen is really long range, and then in order to get there in a timely manner, you have to have you have to have the speed uh, to get there, or it'll, or it'll take forever. So. Uh, about 10 years ago, we lobbied Congress, had uh, this, the Congress tell DOD to start this program called the Future, Ver uh, Future Vertical Lift, FEL. Uh, it's changed and morphed over the past 10 years. Uh, we continue to lobby and get additional funds added every year. Uh, but right now, the, the configuration is there's five capability sets. So that's everything from light to this ultra heavy, which would be like a, a, an A400 or a C-130 size VTOL aircraft. Um, as, and it's not included here, but there's also un, advanced unmanned uh, um, aircraft in, including, included in that as well at the low end. But really, there's really three capability sets now that are kind of in the planning. There's a light one, uh, capability set one. Uh, the Army started a program now called Future Attack Reconnaissance uh, Aircraft, FARA. So this will replace the Kyle Warriors and the, and the smaller aircraft for scout and attack, uh, but again, with that much longer range. The Navy is now looking at having with, uh, 
uh, an application for a capability set two, which is to replace the Seahawks and the Fire Scouts uh, for really long endurance and long range uh, um, surveillance in the maritime environment. Capability set three, which you know is re re corresponds to the kind of the medium uh, class, uh, would replace all the Blackhawks uh, and a lot of other similar missions. Uh, and the Army's program for that is called the Future Long Range Assault Aircraft, so FLARA. Unfortunately, FARA and FLARA, not very different from how to pronounce it. One more thing just to confuse all the different acronyms and how to understand things. The joint multi-role technology demonstrations. So these are these are science and technology demonstrations that uh, that the industry is is primarily funding. So it's about a four to one ratio of industry to government funds. So sort of the, the military is sort of subsidizing this research. So uh, the government, the army's put in about a hundred, little over a hundred million dollars a piece. The companies have each put in about four hundred million dollars. Uh, so over a billion dollars of investment. And, and some kind of ways to think about the differences between FEL and uh, JMR. So, so JMR is actually, there it goes. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, JMR is actually building uh, demonstrators. You can see on the top there. So these are some potentially different applications for this medium class. So it could be attack, could be transport. It could be a lot like what, what the companies have built or it could be nothing like it. In fact, you could really think that the FARA uh, concept is really the is really an application of the uh, the future vertical lift. Um, sorry, the joint multi-role technology demonstration. But so because the companies have shown that they can really build something in a couple years, something revolutionary uh, beyond what's available, uh, what's currently flying today. The Army says, well, fine, this is great. We, you know, it's great that you guys did this demonstration, but what we really want first is we want a smaller one. So based on JMR, really FARA is the first acquisition program out of this. Uh, the government expects to make uh, six study contract awards uh, by June or, or earlier. Uh, then there'll be a down select to have two companies actually fly prototypes in fiscal 23, so late 20, uh, 2022. Uh, again, heavy cost share, but this time it's uh, it's one third, two third, um, and again, this is smaller than much smaller than what the capability set three is, much smaller than GMR, um, and this isn't actually this is actually a, a precursor to an acquisition program. So, in contrast to GMR, which is a demonstrator with not a specific link to an acquisition program, FARA really is designed to have an operational capability uh, within the next ten years. So they're planning to, set, to make six contract awards. This is a guess as to maybe uh, some of the likely candidates who probably propose and, and maybe some of the candidates that will win. Obviously, I don't know what the actual source selection process is, so I don't know who actually proposed or who will be selected, but these are maybe six good guesses. I also want to uh, highlight that the, uh, the ITEP uh, program, the Improved Turbine Engine, uh, was recently awarded to uh, GE uh, with the T900, uh, sorry, the T901 engine. So this is a 3,000 shaft hor horsepower engine. Uh, it's really most advanced uh, turbo shaft ever. It's about 50% more power than is already uh, in the Blackhawk and the Apache, and it's, it's intended to be a drop-in replacement for those uh, engines for those aircraft. But huge improvements in, in uh, fuel consumption and uh, longer life. And this is, uh, this is the engine plan for, for FAR as well. So, um, so this new uh, engine, which can obviously be used for many other applications as well, some of the larger uh, FEL applications, commercial applications, things like that, uh, is really going to have a revolutionary capability for turboshaft powered uh, uh, aircraft. A lot of people associate the, uh, the S-92 Raider uh, with FARA. It's not really, uh, well, it's, uh, I'm sure that Sikorsky's proposal for FARA will be heavily based on this, but uh, it's actually a, a slightly different um, uh, mission and application, whereas, um, I guess I didn't put it on here, but um, it's uh, the 14,000 uh, pound max gross weight for FARA is actually quite a bit larger than the S-97. Uh, the rotor diameter allowance is also larger. Uh, the Army did not allow uh, tilt rotors or any other kind of tandems or anything because they really want to have a 40-foot diameter uh, rotor in order to be able to fit in an urban canyon. So they want to be able to fly down streets and do assaults and, um, and attack missions. Um, and and the, 
Um, the cruise speed is about 185 knots, uh, so it's much less than what the S97 uh, was designed for. So it's not necessar necessarily um, a foregone conclusion that what FAR ends up being, what the comp companies propose, will necessarily be compounds. Um, so basically the, the Raider is a uh, slightly smaller and much faster uh, uh, demonstrator for what could be a FAR application. So uh, changing now to uh, the Capability Set 3. Again, the acronym is uh, Future Long Range Assault Aircraft. So this is really looking at transporting people uh, deep into enemy territory or long distances uh, to be able to go without being subject to attack from uh, long range fires. There were four, uh, uh, there are four companies that have received funding for this. Uh, AVX and Karam Aircraft have also been doing studies and small scale demonstrations. Uh, Bell and Sikorsky were for, uh, funded for the actual demonstration programs. And then again, they put in hundreds of millions of dollars of additional funds into it. Uh, so the um, Sikorsky Boeing Defiant uh, is now undergoing ground testing. Uh, so this is um, from a few weeks ago, and they expect to be flying probably this month, uh, certainly, the next, uh, certainly the next several weeks, but probably this month. Uh, and then the V-280 Valor has flown to 280 knots, has exceeded it actually. And uh, so again, this is a demonstrator that could be applied uh, that, that proves this technology for larger and smaller uh, applications depending on the, on the government's uh, interests. Uh, again, the Army, the, the DOD has not come out with the requirements or even the beginnings of the requirements for what the, uh, the FEL capability set three will be. Uh, so there are still, you know, a year or two away from that. Um, and then once that happens, then the companies can develop designs to actually uh, fulfill that acquisition need. So as a comparison of the different uh, sizes, um, so you see on the top, this is about 30,000, maybe a little bit more, 30,000 class uh, for the JMR demonstrators. You can see then the next tier with the, the Raider, uh, it's about you know similar uh, in kind of size to the uh, the 609, but uh, um, see that's a bit a bit a bit heavier. Um, so again, the the Raider there at uh, 11,000 pounds compared to the the max requirement for FAR of over 14,000 pounds. So it's it's got some more room to to grow to, uh, to fulfill the mission that the Army needs. Uh, so talking a bit more about the uh, about um, civil applications. So the uh, so Leonardo now is uh, hopefully in the in the final uh, year of its uh, certification for the 609. Uh, they're also funded under Clean Sky 2 to demonstrate technologies for next generation civil tilt rotor. They're going to take a 609 and uh, change the wings and the, the tail for it and some other technologies to prove the basics for what this next generation civil tilt rotor uh, uh, would be. Uh, Airbus is also funded to actually uh, to, for their racer compound. Uh, they're actually going to build a demonstrator uh, with the uh, with the EU funding. And then uh, switching now to electric VTOL, so there's a lot of things that, have, uh, that you'll see this week and um, uh, that you've maybe seen already. Uh, so the city Airbus was spotted in Germany. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture that came out, uh, I guess, last night uh, in Germany. Uh, but you also see, you know, Sikorsky's uh, officially announced today that they're that they're doing something in UAM. We've had them on our, uh, uh, we have a website, evtol.news, with over 150 uh, electric VTOL aircraft concepts. We've had them on our site uh, for over a year, uh, describing some of the, the, the things that they've said about it before. Uh, but um, they've now actually released a little bit more information about that. Um, the worker Shorefly, uh, they have a, um, uh, Shorefly has a small exhibit here. Uh, Terrafugia has a large exhibit. Uh, and obviously, I think you guys all know that, uh, that the Bell Nexus is, is on display, and we're expecting that uh, Airbus will have some uh, information and probably models about their UAM uh, aircraft. Uh, so last year, we had our first annual electric VTOL uh, panel on the electric VTOL revolution. So we had uh, um, Uber, uh, Bell, uh, Gamma, and the FAA talking. 
Uh, this year, on Wednesday, we'll have our second annual Electric VTOL Revolution. Very happy that uh, Vertical is uh, moderating and helping us uh, promote that. So we have an all-star cast here of uh, OEMs, uh, major suppliers, um, and operators and investors uh, uh, to, to help ex everybody uh, better understand what the opportunities are, are here. And we're going to try and do kind of a frank uh, assessment of where things are, good and bad, and what the, what the, um, you know, the promise and the challenges are for electric VTOL. So um, electric VTOL, when we talk about generally, we're not talking about, about helicopters, not, ele not electric helicopters. Um, but on the left here, you see the, uh, the Sikorsky Firefly. So these were all the things that they said that they could take out of a helicopter by not having uh, a combustion engine in it. So all the uh, fuel systems, the engine, uh, exhaust, um, the mechanical drive systems uh, in some cases. Uh, so this is a, this is a, a major step, right? But then the batteries at the time from 10 years ago just weren't, weren't there. Um, but we're really talking about something, you know, totally different. Uh, just like when cars were invented, they weren't mechanical horses, although, you know, in China somebody built one. But uh, really with electric helicopter, or sorry, with electric VTOL, it's really looking at getting rid of the complex parts of helicopters. So no, tr no hydraulics, get rid of the transmission gearboxes, shafting, uh, psychic collective and swash plate, and replace this single complex system with, you know, multiple simple thrusters. Now batteries today aren't very good, so if you're just hovering, you're not going to have very much efficiency. So you really need to get on a wing or some other way to have uh, higher speed and longer range. Uh, but we really think there's a, a there there is a promise, and there are applications for maybe not electric helicopters, but you know electric rotorcraft, uh, maybe auto gyros or some other means, especially if they can auto rotate uh, and uh, fly on a wing. So. Really, electric VTOL or electric uh, propulsion allows you to have instead of mechanical uh, connections for for uh, for driving uh, thrusters, now have electric electrical wire. So instead of you know like fly by wire, you really have power by wire, and it really opens up the design space as far as what um, what people can design and and what can operate and and hopefully be uh, commercially successful. So there's a whole electric VTOL revolution, and people talk about urban air mobility. Uh, it's not synonymous. So there's all kinds of things from package, you know, going from small to uh, heavy. There's, uh, you know, Amazon package delivery. There's personal flying devices, uh, ultralight aircraft, um, urban cargo delivery, UAM, and also uh, regional air mobility. So if you look at the uh, the top right there, XTI has a hybrid electric. Uh, VTOL aircraft with about a thousand uh, mile range, so much more of an inter, uh, you know, regional uh, biz jet compared to urban air mobility. So, so just remember that, that they're not quite, they're not synonymous. Uh, and as since we're a technology organization, we we focus on electric and hybrid electric as the technology which enables all these different types of of um, of missions. So, uh, um, so as I mentioned, we have 150 different uh, electric VTOL designs on our, on our website, evtol.news. And uh, Otto Lilienthal, almost 150 years ago, was saying, you know, to invent an aircraft, you know, design an airplane isn't, isn't much. Uh, to build it, you know, okay, that's something, but to fly is everything. Now, this is before anybody had actually built an aircraft and, and had a successful aircraft. So he didn't realize that it's more than just flying. You have to have a commercially successful product that people are going to use and feel safe and, and do missions and, and make money or do whatever it is that you're trying to do with that aircraft. So I look at all these different designs and say, you know, it's easy to design an aircraft if you don't know how, right? It's just like Star Wars. You design something, and this is actually a, a Russian design. Uh, you know, you design something, and, uh, you know, why wouldn't it work? Of course, you just put all these propellers on things, and the wings fold up, and it's, it's just like magic. There's another saying that I heard many years ago that says, if you want to end up with a small fortune in aerospace, you need to start out with a, la a large one. So, so luckily, I'll say, there is a lot of money coming into uh, aerospace now from really the app economy. So you have these uh, different uh, investors, you have a lot of Silicon Valley interest, uh, more than a <coughs> uh, the app economy, <coughs> excuse me, has generated more than a trillion dollars. 
So there's lots of billionaires who are now trying to use some of that wealth to, for the betterment of, of society. And over the last 10 years, you've seen a lot of advancements in, uh, in electric motors. Uh, this is uh, a Joby Motors, uh, a 10 kilowatt motor from uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, advancements in batteries, uh, advancements in computer modeling, simulation, composites. There is some changes on the regulatory front. Uh, so Part 23, which is the, quote, small airplane regulation, uh, they've made that a, a, um, uh, a performance-based spec. So rather than being prescriptive, it says, you know, you just need to be safe, you need to do these things. So the expectation is that there will be uh, ability to adapt that uh, with a lot of standards to be able to fly VTOL aircraft. <clears throat> and we've been working with Gamma. Uh, and they have an uh, electric propulsion innovation committee uh, that, is, that is developing uh, the standards and trying to develop the standards uh, with ASTM uh, that will be applicable for vertical flight for, um, to, to use part 23. And uh, I mentioned before the investments and just lots of techno te uh, technology innovations. Um, so as, as far as um, you know, investment, so here you have SpaceX, right? So a year ago, Elon Musk launched his, his uh, Roadster into space with Starman. Uh, yesterday, uh, or two days ago, SpaceX docked. They've opened the hatch now. So you now have the, 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 we're at the, at the cusp of having manned space travel from a commercial development, developer. It's not NASA anymore. So you have uh, this existence proof where you've, where you've seen that Private industry can invest a lot of money, have these different niche uh, applications that can change society, change things as we knew it. Nobody ever thought you could have a company develop uh, space travel and have it be approved and safe and everything. And I think we'll see the same thing with uh, electric VTOL as well. But what we have to watch out for is the hype cycle. So I mentioned 150 different uh, designs. There's, you know, the, the hype with regards to eVTOL and UAM is just, is just in, incredible. Um, and like the dot-com boom uh, and bust, uh, you know, we want to look at things a little bit more uh, realistically. What are the uh, actual challenges? How can we, how can we work on them uh, so that we, the, the peak isn't as bad and the trough isn't as, as deep? So there's not this boom and bust cycle. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do is help educate people and to provide information to all these people that are coming into aerospace that have no idea about uh, actually man-rated certified aircraft. It's much more difficult than just scaling up a drone so that you can get in, into it. It's, it's not, uh, that's not analogous at all. Um, so we've been having uh, workshops since uh, we, uh, 2014. Uh, at our second workshop in 2016, uh, Uber unveiled that they're going to have this uh, Uber Elevate uh, white paper. They revealed it the next month. Uh, they now have annual summits uh, where they discuss their plans for Uber Elevate. And they've really looked at the, at the big picture of the ecosystem. It's not just developing aircraft. It's all these other things, uh, the real estate, uh, the, the infrastructure, getting cities to approve it with uh, local regulations, uh, federal regulations trying to develop the uh, electric batteries and uh, motors and working with uh, charger, uh, charger manu manufacturers, et cetera, and looking at all, connecting all, these, all the different constituents that would be interested in this. So they're, you know, they're smaller aircraft, so they reduce some of the technological uh, barriers, uh, but they're still very high. And there's the website again. Uh, so uh, Uber is partnering with five of the 150 different uh, companies. Uh, Aurora, Bell, Pipistrel, Karam, and Embraer. Uh, but looking at kind of what needs to be happen, right? What needs to happen to make this uh, this vision of Uber Air possible? Well, they announced in 2016, right, that they're going to have uh, flight demos in 2020. Uh, it'll be operational for passenger carrying service in 2023. Um, they really want to have all electric. Uh, not, I mean, the, the requirement is to have all electric, so not hybrid and five seats, that's uh, pilot uh, plus a passenger. There's lots of uh, infrastructure that's required. Um, these aren't gonna be heliports, but they'll need some sort of uh, certification and approval uh, for, uh, for operation as, as skyports, as they call it. Um, there's a pilot shortage now. They wanna have thousands of, of uh, 
uh, flights uh, per hour from different, uh, uh, in different cities, right? So they need tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pilots. Eventually they'll get to be autonomous uh, flight, they hope, uh, but until they get to that point, they're gonna, they're gonna have a huge need for pilots. Uh, and then I mentioned the regulations as well. All right, so 2020 was when the flights demos were, were supposed to happen. And so what do we have today, right? So you look at the bottom. So uh, Bell has developed a mock-up. And it's hybrid, so it's not, uh, it doesn't meet their requirement of being all electric, right? But they're on a path to develop it. So, so maybe they won't, uh, you know, may, maybe all these things won't, these five simultaneous miracles won't happen. You see uh, Boeing has, a, has uh, gotten off the ground a two-seat aircraft all electric and they've hovered unmanned a few feet right so that's what they've gotten uh, pipistrel we've seen they have a, a, a small scale uh, test with their uh, VTOL propulsion system so these are all steps along the way and as I said in the eVTOL uh, panel last year all right so maybe it won't be 2023 maybe 2028 or or some other dates right and maybe it won't have all these different capabilities exactly how Uber envisioned it. But that's why you have this vision. That's why you, you throw that out there saying, this is what we're trying to get to. Uh, but if they can get to, you know, to, to most of these within a reasonable amount of time, I think that they will be able to uh, really change the society. Uh, but it's not just them. They have competition with other, uh, other developers. Um, the, the, most of the other big uh, airframe companies, so Airbus and Sikorsky and, and others, uh, they're not planning to work with Uber, they're competing. Another company, uh, Joby Aviation, is arguably the, the farthest ahead of anybody. They do have a, a four-seat aircraft that's flying uh, with uh, very good range uh, and endurance. Um, and uh, of course, you know, for, compared to a Robinson uh, R44 uh, in, in uh, size, these are to scale, it's also much heavier and much larger, so much more complex and it'll be more expensive. But the idea is that it could be ultra quiet much faster and have very high productivity rates um, as it you know flies from from city center to city city center. There are also uh, ultralight aircraft uh, flying today. So the uh, the FAA's uh, Part 103 uh, doesn't require certification. The aircraft just has to be less than 254 pounds, and you can kind of almost do anything you want with it. Uh, but it's 254 pounds plus you get 30 pounds per float plus parachute. So if you look at the the bottom there. Uh, by adding floats, uh, the lift uh, um, hexa that was uh, unveiled uh, in December, it got up to three, 434, 32 pounds. So that's five floats, that's uh, you know, five times 30 pounds, that's 150 pounds of extra. Of course, the floats don't weigh 30 pounds, right? The parachute was um, 28 pounds. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's tw the 254 uh, pounds is a, is a hard rule, except there's lots of exceptions. Uh, gyro planes also, so we don't hear much about uh, uh, auto gyros at Heli Expo, but um, you know, auto gyro in Germany is selling over three, three, 300 uh, auto gyros a, a year. Uh, Magna gyro has also sold more than a thousand auto uh, gyro planes to date. Um, auto gyro, they, they, they built a uh, hybrid electric e Cavalon, uh, the aircraft down the bottom there, uh, but you know, several years ago, but it the, the batteries, the capability wasn't there. In the U.S., uh, lots of restrictions from, a uh, lot of restrictions on, on uh, auto gyros. So basically they're restricted to experimental home-built kits. There's no good regulations to approve them. Uh, auto Gyro USA has uh, uh, just got one of their aircraft approved under the primary category. Uh, so a little bit different. Maybe that's a, a window where other aircraft can, can be cert, uh, certificated. But on a larger end, which would be applicable to, to Part 27, or maybe even Part 29, uh, the Carter Copter uh, uh, technology was, was bought by a company called uh, uh, Jaunt Air Mobility. Uh, they've been working with uh, Uber for a few years. Uh, and they hope to be uh, uh, able to be the sixth Uber Elevate partner. And you look at what the comparison is, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned before, as far as um, the, the Part 25 regulations. So they could be certified under Part 27. So maybe that's a, a, an alternative to be uh, to get around uh, regulatory obstacles. Uh, Skyworks Global, which is an investment company, bought uh, Grown Brothers um, uh, intellectual property. Uh, so they have both this tip jet, uh, vertijet uh, concept as well as 
uh, and eGyro they're, uh, they're developing. So some inter interesting uh, developments from that perspective. Uh, GoFly is a competition that's being sponsored by Boeing and others, and it's to develop a personal uh, VTOL uh, flying device, okay? So 20 miles, single person, very, very compact and, and quieter than any other jet pack or anything else that's out there. Uh, so they made uh, awards to 10, uh, 10 teams for this uh, phase one. Uh, there are uh, 40 teams who are competing in phase two, and they're going to do a down select for that in another, like another month, I think April, I'm going to say April 16th. So uh, we've been leading efforts in electric VTOL again since uh, our first workshop we had in, in 2014. Uh, we've got huge resources on electric VTOL as well as uh, conventional uh, helicopters, vertical takeoff and, and landing aircraft. We invite you to use us as a resource. Um, we have the, uh, as far as eVTOL, we've got the newsletter, the website, et cetera. And when you look back at our history, again, 76 years ago, years, years ago uh, you know, we had the pioneers of the industry, Igor Sikorsky, Art Young, Frank Piasecki, uh, sitting there at the head table uh, looking at us and thinking, these, uh, these helicopters are so different from airplanes, but we think we can make them work. Our first workshop in 2014, it's the same thing. You've got some of the real legends in electric VTOL looking at us and, and believing that the, f the future is there. Uh, and six years ago, people scoffed at the idea, and now you look at Heli Expo, and it's, it's, uh, it's all through, uh, all through the, the, the meeting here. So we're having our 75th annual forum, as I mentioned, in, in Philadelphia. We invite you all to come. Uh, generally, uh, should be more than 1,200 engineers, scientists. We got the, the uh, executives from the industry, leaders in, in government. Uh, we have technical papers as well as panelists, exhibitors, grand awards banquet, uh, short course, uh, industry tours, etc. So. Uh, we invite you guys to come. That's free attendance for the for the media. We'd love to have you guys there and and cover this this special event uh, with us. Uh, in summary, so we're we are the Global Vertical Flight Society. Uh, lots of uh, very exciting civil and military advanced rotorcraft developments underway. Uh, we have resources on these different programs. If you need information, we're happy to to help. Um, I will put all these slides uh, online. I was hoping to get it done beforehand, but it can, uh, it'll, it'll be on shortly. Um, and we're invest, uh, s uh, significant funds are being invested in electric VTOL. Um, we've got a, a website on that. And with that, I uh, thank you, and I'll uh, take this time to ask for any questions from the audience. Garrett Ream, Flight Global. Um, I'm wondering in the small UAV uh, realm, we see more and more thrust vectoring. Uh, and I wonder if there are advantages uh, for the future EVTOL passenger market uh, for using that technology, um, disadvantages, challenges. Um, what are your thoughts on incorporating that? Uh, so if you can fly on a wing, you can have so much more efficiency than flying on a, on a thruster, right? So helicopters aren't very efficient because they're, the rotors aren't very efficient. So whether it's small scale, it's really more kind of the opposite thing where things in the past have been you do thrust vectoring for manned aircraft or larger aircraft, but now it's with miniaturization, it's being applied more to uh, to drones. So, um, so I think that, I mean, that, that it's a whole spectrum between small, you know, micro vehicles and drones to, to manned aircraft <coughs> and uh, regional aircraft. So, does that answer your question? You talk about thrust vectoring as far as tilting the propellers. Would it be useful for getting out of tight spaces for a lot of these urban applications, um, reducing control services, that sort of thing, or is it does it not apply to these larger aircraft? Um, yeah, I, th I think any way that um, you know thrust vectoring is very useful, but there's a, a penalty for having you know more gadgetry and more uh, complexity. So, and that's really the thing about aircraft design is it's really a, it's really a everything's a trade space, right? Of, of trading weight, complexity, cost versus uh, the the benefits of doing that, so efficiency. Tony Oswald with Aviation Week. You said that you think the on fly on far a forty foot rotor diameter will disqualify a tilt rotor. Um, what what are the things have Bell have played with, or could they end up using this Nexus technology to produce something like that? 
Fafara. Uh, I missed part of that. So you're asking if, if they could use Nexus? Yeah, technology? they can't use tilt rotor by the sounds of it because of the right. rotor diameter. Right. Do you think they could end up using Nexus style? Well, I, I mean, that's still sort of a tilting duct uh, configuration. So it's really the, it's a it's total aircraft width, and I'm not sure if it's explicitly stated no tilt rotors and no tandems, uh, but it was, uh, um, you know, Bell has a long history of making helicopters, and uh, I'm, I'm sure they have no problem develop you know designing a, a helicopter uh, to meet the mission requirements. Uh, Mike Guy Norris from Aviation Week. Um, you mentioned f five miracles to get to Uber Elevate, then to make it happen. Of those five, which one do you think is the most miraculous of all? Do you have a? Is there a long pole in that heavenly tent? Um, I think that. Um, I mean, th there are different batteries that are being looked at today. Uh, conventional, you know, conventional. Uh, Lithium-ion batteries today don't have enough enough juice to really do it. It does not appear that it has it to do it within the, the next year or two. Um, but there are new new battery technologies being developed. So I think it's really just, you know, batteries suck. They have very low uh, energy density. They can't, uh, they don't, you know, it's 1 20th, 1 50th of what a, what a uh, liquid fuel has in comparison based on, based on, uh, on weight. So that, uh, that's probably the power is the biggest one, you think, then? The infrastructure, the regulations, the, the availability of... Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because I think uh, if you want to go all electric again, if you want to go all electric, then I think that's, that's the challenge. Um, the, ones, the, the, the one graphic I had that showed this, the, the, um, the spectrum, the heavier you go, the heavier you are, the more you need hybrid in this day and age. And hybrid has that extra power... You can still have good good efficiency, but you're going to have emissions, you know, tailpipe emissions. So, in my opinion, uh, that's probably the, the 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 biggest problem today as far as it, of meeting their their vision within the the time frame. Uh, uh, last question, Tim. Uh, Tim Martin, Shepherd Media. Uh, just on future vertical lift. So, as we approach um, the change from JMRTD to formal funding on FEL. Um, do you see, you mentioned the, the ratio between industry and uh, DOD money. Do you see that changing at all once the presidential budget is announced, or how, how do you see that? So it's interesting uh, about the president's budget for uh, fiscal 2020. Um, you know, there's, there's not really any, I mean, the companies don't need any more money for JMR because that's a demonstration that they're doing, right? right? So, right. but in order to actually take that technology and either develop a, develop a, uh, an actual aircraft for the military that's that size or bigger or smaller, yes, then they'll need billions of dollars uh, to do that. But until the government tells industry what they want, again, is it, is it, does it need to be that fast? Does it need to be that big? Does it need to be bigger? Um, you know, the, the companies don't need money. They need, they need answers. <laughs> And some companies are talking about if that investment isn't large enough, they'll be forced to, to pull back funding. Do you, do you see that as possible, or do you see that as more kind of strategy and, and Well, I, I, don't know, I don't know that they mean large enough. They either needs to be money that the, if the government wants to buy a new aircraft, they need to fund the development, and that's generally done 100%. Uh, so if the, if the government doesn't fund the industry for a new requirement, then there's... What, what Bell and the other companies are really saying is if, if the government doesn't come out with a requirement, I mean, there's no reason for us to keep flying this aircraft because we've already proved everything we needed to do with the demonstrator. We're not going to develop a weapon system. We're not going to develop a product. We're just developing the, the technology demonstrator. So it's, it's not quite the right question or answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm happy to talk to anybody uh, afterwards, uh, and I will send out the slides to everybody who's, who had gotten a previous email. Uh, but you'll also be able to fi find it on the evutall.news website. So thank you all for coming.